All right. I want to welcome everybody to another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live. And as we try to do every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific, I have interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And my longtime friend and neighbor, Ken Simon, joins me this morning. Good morning, Ken. It's good to see you. Hey, Bernard. Always a pleasure. Great to see you. Well, I appreciate you making some time for me this morning. I'm looking forward to our conversation for some time now. Uh, but before we, and Ken, I don't know if my internet's kind of funky today, so just holler at me if it if it's slow or so you don't hear me. But okay. Ken is a longtime no, a litigator. Deal. Ken is a longtime litigator, attorney, former judge and now very successful mediator in the Birmingham area. And we're gonna jump into those things. Uh, but before we do, Ken, I, I've kind of described who you are professionally a little bit, but if you would tell the folks a little bit more about yourself and your awesome family and those kind of good things. I'll be glad to, Bernard. I'm gonna pretend that we're sitting on your front porch with a glass <laughs> of wine, okay? There we go. All right, so, um, uh, I think most people know Sabrina, my wife. We met in law school in Tuscaloosa, and uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, she's allowed me to hold on to her for, for these last 40 years or so of, of knowing each other. Married, uh, um, I don't know, 35, 36 years, somewhere in there. And uh, we have three wonderful uh, young people, our children, uh, Zach, uh, the oldest, uh, uh, Rachel and Sarah. Zach's in Birmingham, and Rachel is in Atlanta now, uh, and Sarah's in San Francisco. And uh, like you, our children really were raised by uh, by Ali Bolka, uh, the neighborhood nanny, uh, and uh, uh, they went to school. Uh, they all started out at the JCC, and uh, then uh, found their way to um, uh, John Carroll and Advent and 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 then on to college. So um, uh, they're mostly off the payroll now. So I think that makes us a successful parents. Are, are they are they ever going to be? I mean, for most kids these days. But but Ken, one of the one of the beautiful things about in our neighborhood in Forest Park, close to downtown, it was yeah. is and was and is Ali Bolka. And she's affectionately known as the Wacky Nanny or the Forest Park Nanny. But what was so great about her is there were so many families that were it connected with her that we, we would all go out our respective ways, but there would typically be one house in the neighborhood where all the kids would end up congregating for the night. So you'd go and pick up your children at one of our homes and there might be 10 or 11 kids asleep or hanging out with Allie uh, at the house. And I've always appreciated that about Allie and all of our families and friendships. So that, that just brings me just warm uh, thoughts and memories from those days. You're, you're so right, Bernard. In fact, I think we can take credit. Sabrina was the first person to hire Allie, then a UAB student, uh, as a nanny. And from there, uh, things just sort of took off. And probably even today, you might see Allie uh, hosting a sleepover for kids or doing something that only a wacky nanny could think of and do. And uh, uh, she has connected so many of our families, uh, uh, relationships that uh, that last beyond her actual time as, uh, as a nanny. Uh, That's exactly right. Well, Ken, many, let's, many, many let's, friends pivot. let's pivot for a minute and kind of talk about your journey coming to Birmingham. Where did you grow up? And, and I know you went to law school and, and, and spent time in Tuscaloosa, but where are you from originally? Well, um, Mobile is home for me. And uh, of course, if you're from Mobile, that's always home. It's a weird thing about uh, Mobilians. Um, I'm sure if you're from Dothan, you don't feel that way. No, I'm wrong. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, Dothan's always home for you. Uh, but in I grew up in Mobile, Bernard, and um, went to public school there, then to University of South Alabama mm -hmm. for, uh, for college. And um, uh, if I can take just a slight detour, uh, uh, the idea formed in my head to get into the law uh, as a high school student uh, in Mobile. 
And the reason was Mobile was sort of a hot spot at that time for uh, a lot of civil rights litigation uh, mm -hmm. over the school system, over the change of government, um, uh, just a, a number of things. And it attracted people from all over the country. The, uh, the um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, they were regular visitors. And it just so happened that my grandfather lived directly across the street from the law office of the only African-American law firm uh, at that time in Mobile. So I would see these lawyers coming and going from out of town, the local lawyers there uh, who um, uh, were involved in these cases. And the idea sort of formed in my head that, man, you know what? Uh, these lawyers are leaders in their community. Uh, they're taking the skills that they learned in law school and in practice, and they're applying those same skills, those same values uh, in the everyday practice of law. So somehow I sort of soaked that in and uh, the idea stuck with me that that's what you want to do. And so really everything since then in my career has all been focused on that it, the, the, the seed came from, from that experience of seeing the lawyer's mobile operate. And uh, so when I got to college, mm -hmm. uh, I sort of focused all my studies. I was on the debate team to, to learn how to argue. Uh, everything was focused on um, uh, becoming a lawyer. And um, still, when I was... Uh, uh, when I went to law school in Tuscaloosa, I started in 1976 um, and making it out. So naturally, I was going to go back to Mobile <laughs> to practice law, which I did. And um, uh, shall I go on? Uh, there's so much. I got so many stories, Bernard. I oh, can yeah. well, Ken, this is our this is our time to to chat okay. about them. I was going to ask you, who are some of your early influences in the law, in addition to the lawyers? who you saw across the street from your grandparents in, in Mobile, were there other lawyers or professors who really influenced you that you tried to, to follow? Well, that's, that is a great question. I, I would say that the lawyers as a group, uh, the lawyers at uh, the, the law firm was then known as, uh, uh, it was Vernon Crawford, um, a, a, a fantastic uh, lawyer, uh, by the name of A.J. Cooper, uh, who was the first African-American mayor uh, in the city of Pritchard, Frankie Phil Smith, uh, Michael Figures, and, uh, and their firm was an integrated law firm at that time. Uh, uh, my friend and our Forest Park neighbor, Jim Blackshear, I don't know if you've met Jim yet, but Jim Blackshear, well-known, nationally known civil rights lawyer, uh, Larry Benefi, Greg Stein, uh, those guys were, I mean, they, they went at it and, and they, they brought in people like J Jack Greenberg from the NAA Legal Defense Fund, uh, among many others, to, uh, to fight with them in those cases. So I would say that collectively as a group, they were, uh, they were an example to me. And of course, they never knew this. <laughs> I'm just a kid across the street. Uh, but, uh, you know, often we can have influence uh, uh, on other people that we don't, we're not even aware of. Um, and so when I, uh, when I got to college um, at South and then went on to law school, we basically had a really segregated bar at that time throughout the state. And uh, with the exception of uh, the... Um, uh, the Vernon Crawford law firm, but you really couldn't point to any other law firms that were integrated at that time. Uh, I believe in Dothan, uh, eventually you had uh, Judge Thompson, Myron Thompson as a young lawyer. Um, he and a, a, a white lawyer joined forces, if I recall correctly, but when it came to law firms, um, uh, the, the bigger law firms, uh, they just weren't integrated. There were just all kinds of social barriers in place. You know, another one that comes to mind, and I, I'm, I'm not sure when they formed mm -hmm. their firm, but Dolores Boyd and Howard Mandel in Montgomery joined forces. You're exactly right. 
sometime after Howard finished uh, his clerkship with Judge Johnson. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. Side note, I'll tell you what my, that time my brother, mm -hmm. my yeah, brother I can't, David. Uh, go ahead, Ken. That time. <laughs> too sorry. I can't tell you what that timeline is, but I, I can tell you about my my own timeline. And uh, as I was in college, um, you know, the weird thing is, um, and this is how things seem to work. Um, I got into a uh, a dispute in college uh, in a, a race for student government president. I was. Uh, I had been the SGA vice president at South, and uh, as I said, everything, everything, I'm, my whole mentality was to become a lawyer. So part of that was getting ready for public service, and uh, that meant student government, right? So uh, I'm running for SGA president uh, at South, and um, that was a sort of another barrier that uh, had to be overcome, had to break the color line, uh, even on campus at South. And um, my opponent uh, was endorsed by the anchor of the local, by a local television station the night before the election. Um, in fact, the anchor <laughs> on TV uh, encourages the audience, the South students watching to go out and vote, not just once, but many times for my opponent. What kind of felt like that with my phones? And, um, uh, I ended up losing uh, the election that next day, but I challenged the election uh, again, trying to show that, hey, look, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to treat this as a lawyer would. I challenged it and um, sought advice from a local lawyer who told me I didn't have a case, but um, uh, the basis of my of my challenge was that this violated the uh, the Federal Communications Commission's fairness doctrine. And uh, that is if, if one person uh, was endorsed or had a certain amount of airtime on a station, then the opponent would be entitled to equal time. That was a fairness doctrine. I don't know if that's still in effect uh, or not, but uh, that was the basis of my challenge. So I challenged the election and uh, our student Supreme Court said, you know what, you're right. So we had a redo, and uh, and I won uh, that student election uh, in a landslide. Well, I've I mentioned all that because it introduced me to uh, a law firm, uh, the firm where I was told that I, I didn't have a case. Uh, we actually got to be really good friends, and um, um, uh, there was a lawyer there by the name of Ned Nelson, who was my contact there, but he introduced me to his to his partners, uh, Burt Nettles, mm -hmm. Emmett Cox, uh, and uh, and others. Well, um, one thing sort of led to another, and as I entered into my senior year of uh, law school, Bernard, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, undergraduate school. <laughs> I realized that I had never been in a law office other than just that one brief visit. And I had no idea of how a law firm operated or what lawyers really did. Mm -hmm. you know, somehow it was in my mind that that was what I wanted to do. So they gave me the opportunity to, uh, to clerk, uh, or I was a runner mm -hmm. at the firm. It was called Nettles, Cox, and Barker. What city was this in? Ken? This was in Mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might know Bert Nettles, who's a local lawyer here in Birmingham now. Mm -hmm. um, and the Cox in that name was Emmett Cox, uh, who um, retired a few years ago from the 11th Circuit uh, mm -hmm. Court of Appeals. And, uh, but they hired me as a, as a runner. <laughs> uh, so I spent most of my senior year in college as a runner. And, um, and during law school, they said, well, uh, would you like to clerk for us during the summers? Mm -hmm. And so I said, and here's the thing, uh, people told me, other lawyers in the city said, well, they will never hire you uh, as a lawyer because of the color barrier. They just aren't gonna do that. 
They said, look, these guys are all conservative Republicans and it's just not gonna happen for you. Um, and, and things aren't going to change. <clears throat> well, things did change because they actually did hire me uh, as a lawyer. And as far as I know, that was the first time that uh, in the state that um, a majority white law firm hired um, a black lawyer. That year was 1979. And uh, um, I, I, I consider that a real milestone in my own career uh, and, and pretty important. Today, um, it, you know, that situation has changed completely, but it had to start somewhere. And um, whether it was Jim Blatcher, Greg Menefee and Vernon Crawford or, or Myron Thompson and his partner, or Dolores Boyd, uh, there were some small beginnings there, but uh, um, the practice of law from a from a standpoint of uh, inclusiveness is, has changed a great deal uh, in these last 40 years. Well, I, I was going to say, Ken, in, this, in these 40 years, there's been lots of changes. Um, you were on the bench in Jefferson County as a, as a judge, what, in the early 90s. Yes, and if you look at the makeup of the Jefferson County bench now, it's dramatically changed from exactly. from the '90s. Uh, were you one of, if not the first, African American judges uh, in Jefferson County on a circuit court level? Well, uh, I was one of the first. Uh, uh, judge Cook, Ralph Cook, mm -hmm. of, in Bessemer, was the first. Uh, and he was followed by Judge Pearson in, in Birmingham, and uh, I followed Judge Pearson. I, I couldn't uh, remember the order, but it was right when I was coming out of law school. Uh, right. You were on the bench around that same time. Uh, but great. now, coming coming forward, and we'll we'll come back to this in just a minute. And I appreciate you sharing your right. your history with us. But now you have a very active mediation practice. And I want to talk about that for just a few mm -hmm. minutes. What, what people may sure. or may not understand is that, that mediation, most of the time, is a voluntary process where the parties come together to work out their differences. Sometimes right. the court will order mediation. And that's the, the parties have to follow the court's order. So kicking and screaming, they may be getting together. But yep. I want I want to... I want you to talk to us a little bit about the mindset that you see of the participants coming to mediation and tell us what type of cases that you've been handling. Pardon me, I thought I'd turn this off, but I guess I didn't. <laughs> no worries. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, let me tell you about uh, just sort of my take on mediation. I need to make mm -hmm. sure this thing, oh well. Um, well, the mindset, Bernard, uh, really has changed quite a bit. Uh, uh, I got interested in mediation when I was still on the bench. This is in the early 1990s. And uh, at that time, it was basically being championed by uh, just a handful of people. Uh, and I have to say that the drum major, the leading drum major at that time for mediation was none other than Rodney Max. <laughs> Rod had, uh, um, uh, he'd come from Florida. Uh, and in Florida, mediation was something that was uh, very much a part of the legal landscape, but it really had not caught on at all uh, in, uh, in Alabama. And uh, Rod just was very persistent and a visionary. And he sort of envisioned the idea of, of getting people together uh, of, uh, of trying to find ways to mediate cases. And he really took it seriously, led the effort to get the Supreme Court to adopt a set of mediation rules and uh, just a constant champion. Well, uh, in the early 90s, we, we had dockets that were just almost out of control. Uh, I had on my case, uh, on my docket about 700 cases most of the other judges also just had uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases on their dockets. Not that many cases really settled. In, in reality, you'd hear people saying that, that uh, 
nine out of 10 cases would settle. Well, uh, the problem is when you've got seven or 800 cases on your docket, you're still gonna be in trial every week. And uh, I was on the bench for about four years. And uh, over that period of time, I, I had at least a hundred jury trials. Wow. Which is unimaginable. It's every other week. Yeah, <laughs> oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying um, often big cases, malpractice cases, cases that will take a week, two weeks. Uh, and, uh, and, and you also have your non-jury docket. Um, so we had to do something. And uh, so mediation was a thing that we, we started to push. And so I sort of joined in that effort and um, I, I could see the real benefits of, uh, of mediation. So the mindset though of most lawyers was, oh, it's a sign of weakness to agree to try to settle cases. Uh, oh, um, what's the difference between mediation and arbitration? Mm -hmm. uh, hardly, few, few people, few lawyers uh, even understood uh, what it was all about. And so it took quite some time uh, for people to get educated uh, and to, um, uh, to actually start mediating cases. So um, eventually people kind of got used to it. They, start, they started to understand that uh, it was something that was worth doing. It wasn't a sign of weakness to try to negotiate. And uh, I'd say by the mid nineties, late nineties, it really started to take off. And, and since then um, it's, it's become part of uh, of our own legal landscape here in Alabama. And you know, Ken, it's for what my brother David and I do, workers' comp is the most of our, our practice. That's just the natural part of what we do. Our trials, as you know, are just, they're judged, they're bench trials. Correct. But mediation, just the work comp uh, laws and the issues between the parties just kind of lend themselves to mediation. So we mediate every month. Now, those kind of cases, work comp cases, are meant to be a lot quicker in resolving. We can define the issues and hopefully mediate a case in a couple of hours. Sometimes we do two in a day, but that's not the type of cases that you're mediating. Most of ours are through the state ombudsman program with the Department of right. Labor. There's a couple of lawyers, practitioners who do a lot of mediating as well when we can't right. get to the, the state ombudsman's, but you're mediating some very complex matters. Now, of course, we're not going to get into the names and parties and, and particular things, but I want people to know the nature of the cases that you mediate and why they're complex and need so much involvement by the mediator, by you, to know what's going on. And that's where you bring your 40 years of experience to the table, and I think that's what makes you such an effective mediator. Well, well thank you for saying that. And uh... You know, sometimes it's just really unexpected things that, that can make a case complex to mediate. Uh, sometimes it's just the nature of the case. There are just many, many parties involved, or there's a lot of money at stake, uh, and, um, and, and you know it's going to be a, a long and difficult process to get, uh, to get a case resolved. And, and that's what you would expect. But, but other times, <laughs> what makes a case complex has nothing to do with that. It can just be the personalities involved, Bernard. Uh, you know, it, it can be, um, let's say two business partners that have had a falling out and they just can't stand to be around each other and they won't agree to what the other party has agreed to. And so it can become a, a sort of a difficult dance to get the parties just to, uh, just to participate in the process which can add to the complexity. Sometimes it's things that you, you really didn't see coming. It might be in a personal injury case, uh, one of the local hospitals might say that, hey, look, we've got an interest in this. We have a large uh, uh, amount that's owing to us and we're just not gonna let you all settle this case out from under us and, 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 and we get left behind and, and don't get our share of, of the proceeds. Uh, and that can lead to uh, you know, a lot of legal issues uh, that you've got to spend the time trying to, uh, to unwind and developing. And, and other times, uh, it is the nature of the case, though. <laughs> and uh, 
I just finished, I think we've just finished uh, about a year and a half, almost two year long mediation process uh, in a um, class action case in one of the black belt counties. And it's a case that involved federal claims in Mobile, uh, state claims in, uh, in Selma, in Dallas County, and uh, uh, many, many sophisticated parties uh, with, uh, who are defendants against uh, local residents uh, uh, in, in Dallas County and surrounding areas. And it just took a, a long time to work through each set of issues. Um, and um, the lawyers were outstanding, just very good, which meant that um, no issue went unturned and, and unexamined. So we had to work through all those issues, uh, but we got there. And uh, what I found that uh, helps me in, in trying to get a case settled is uh, I think what I can bring to the table is just uh, having been there uh, as a judge, as a lawyer, et cetera, and, and seeing how cases uh, do work out. Um, my goal is to sort of bring a sense of reality uh, to the parties. It's usually not the lawyers that I've got to convince, but instead their clients. And uh, the clients haven't been through this sort of thing before. And um, uh, what my goal is to help them understand uh, the risks that they're taking on by going to trial, um, how their expectations might be maybe not in line with reality, um, and, uh, and helping them understand the benefit of uh, having a case resolved versus um, taking your chances uh, with a jury. So you, you, you uh, those things of, work together to get cases worked out. I was going to say you take the emotion out of the equation. Yep. And the parties can be all charged up. The lawyers could be all charged up. But that's why you you do what you do. And for those of you who are just joining us or may see us later on in replay, I'm talking with Ken Simon, with the Ken Simon Law Firm in Birmingham. Ken has been a judge here in town and has uh, brought some of his experiences to his now very successful mediation process. And Ken, I've always heard that the most successful mediation is when none of the parties are happy because they have resolved for by taking maybe a little bit less than they came to get, and they made right. the party on the other side pay a little bit more than they wanted to pay. So everybody's mad at everybody, but it's resolved. And it probably is, is uh, that's the way I've always heard the success yes, of mediation. Right. Am, I, am I close at all? Well, you're, you're, you're absolutely close. And uh, um, that, you know, there's a, it's sort of uh, is, this is one of those sayings in the mediation world, you know, that um, the perfect settlement is one when both sides are unhappy. <laughs> and there really is a lot of truth to that. But you know what? Uh, I've discovered that the lawyers have become much more sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, their understanding of what a good settlement is. And um, uh, if, if I were to adjust that saying somewhat, um, I would say that uh, it, uh, it's a good settlement because the lawyers recognize that number one, it is resolved. And, and two, uh, the, the client, um, understands why the case had to get settled. And if the clients can understand that, um, uh, even though it doesn't meet with what their expectations were, the lawyers have done their job. Well, Ken, let me, let me ask you about your, your observation and your experience from the, the 90s when you went onto the bench for those years and you were trying sure. all of those cases and coming forward to 2020, uh, let's just say pre-pandemic, and we'll get to that part yeah. in just a minute. Has the trend been, at least my experience of this, that there's less and less cases actually being tried in the courthouse, and more and more cases are being resolved either through formal or informal mediation sessions? Is well, that a fair? Th assessment? That is a 
I think that is a very fair statement, uh, Bernard, and there, I'm sure there are many reasons for it. But uh, back in the early 90s, um, um, there was a huge backlog of cases. Mm -hmm. and, and that was partially because uh, tort litigation had just taken off in the 1980s. And Alabama sort of acquired the reputation as being tort hell. Well, the plaintiff's lawyers were just way ahead of everybody else. And they understood uh, how they could really be successful um, you know, with the way in which they approached cases. So class actions became more of a thing. Uh, complex products cases became more of a thing. Mass torts started to become a thing. Uh, cases against finance companies and what were perceived, what, mm -hmm. what uh, was perceived to be an industry with a lot of abuse in it, um, they had, there was a lot more recognition of things that, um, uh, of how the law could be used to change some of those uh, predatory type practices. So the result was um, a huge explosion of cases in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, but it nearly choked the courts <laughs> to death because the courts really could not handle that kind of volume. And, and frankly speaking, uh, the methods that were being used to manage cases were, were really um, from the Middle Ages. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a, just a lot of uh, benign neglect. The judges didn't really manage them. The cases got filed. But it could be years before you could expect ever to go to trial. And go ahead, Ken. All right. Well, uh, with that situation, uh, I think the bar, particularly the plaintiff's bar, just sort of said, Mr. Chief Justice, who was Sonny Hornsby at the time, said, things have got to change. This just can't go on. We can't get our cases tried. People can't get the justice, justice that they're seeking. And so that led then to Sonny Hornsby sort of imposing uh, what we now know as as uh, differential case management. That is uh, a process of, at the outset, you, you, the, you figure out uh, what needs to happen in a case, how to get it moving, put it on a schedule, and, uh, and you, you keep pushing until the case is worked out. There was more accountability on the bench. Uh, when I, uh, just before I took the bench, uh, you didn't, uh, judges weren't really assigned to particular cases in Jefferson County. Right, right. And so there wasn't any accountability. And so you had these enormous backups and, um, and uh, again, things had to change and they did. They, they certainly did. And now when you file a lawsuit in Birmingham, within minutes, it gets routed and assigned to a judge randomly. So you know exactly who your judge is Right. Uh, to start your case within a matter of minutes. And I love that, that Alabama has had the electronic filing um, for so many years now. Yes. The courthouse is, is virtually and literally open whenever you need it from those purposes. That's right. Now, Ken, with, with over the years, at least in my practice, with the cost of health care associated with work comp claims just skyrocketing as they are across all society. Right. The, the money at stake for the insurance companies has just gone through the roof. So the mediation uh, practice part of work comp has become so vitally important for all parties right. Right. that it really is, it, I'm not going to say it's underutilized because at least it's not in our practice because we, like I said earlier, we use it all the time. But I think that now a lot of judges will put in their orders, see if you can go work your differences out with the state ombudsman program. And if you can't, come see me. And right. sure. most of the time you can get them worked out that way. So I applaud the, the, the fine mediators we have throughout the state who do this kind of work. Right. But here's, here's my question for you now. Coming okay. down, we're in the pandemic. There's no jury trials right now in Alabama, right. at least through, I think into September. And we don't know what the future is going to hold. Now, the courthouse is, is open virtually. We are having Zoom-like hearings and conferences quite often. And the courts are learning, as all the parties are, how to do all of this. I would think that the mediation practice, such as yours, 
is even more important now to have what we'll call access to justice, to get resolution to your cases. Are you seeing and hearing from practitioners that more and more want to go that route so that their cases just don't get stale, so they don't have their day, so to speak? Well, well, answer is yes, and you're, you're exactly right. Um, this is one of those unusual times where the way forward to get past uh, the situation that we find ourselves in because of uh, COVID-19, the way forward really is mediation. Otherwise, your cases are going to just sit there because there's no practical way that you can get them tried, either before a judge and certainly not before a jury. I think the courts have already said we're not having any more jury trials mm -hmm. uh, for the foreseeable future. So mediation makes a lot of sense. If, if you can if you have evaluated your case, you know what it's about, both sides have done enough homework to, uh, to understand what the issues are, um, well then we need to strongly consider getting these cases resolved uh, through mediation. And um, yeah, I really think that's important in the workers' comp realm uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, the most important is, um, uh, injured, injured workers, I, I just have a lot of sympathy for them. Do you know, Bernard, what the average weekly uh, wage payment was when I started on the bench in uh, 1992? You mean the, the under the work compact? Under the workers' compact. I think it's the same as it is today. <laughs> yeah, it was what, $220 a week? 220 which is, it, it's now flipped because of our economy and the, the rise of the cost of living at the time, 220 represented two thirds of the average weekly wage of Alabamians. Right. Now it's that wasn't than, enough then. Now it's less than one third and not to get on my soapbox because I could, <laughs> but we're the lowest paying state in the country. It's and so that's just to kind of piggyback what you're saying, Ken, that's why it's so vitally important that the mediation process it is used as often as we can. Exactly. Right. When you get hurt on the job, all of life stressors ramp up. Your your Thanks, health, Steve. your finances, your job, your communication in the family, putting food on the table, paying the bills, all of that just escalates. And getting to mediation helps us to bring some resolution and hopefully de-stress a little bit of the situation for the client. Well, that's that's exactly right. And you know, it's not only a financial issue, but often it's a medical issue too, because if there's a dispute about the uh, about what kind of treatment that you might be entitled to, uh, that needs to get worked out uh, as well. So mediation under the ombudsman program uh, to me just makes a tremendous amount of sense uh, to get quicker resolution uh, for injured workers and, and not to have to go through the long process that might be involved uh, in, in and having a judge decide a case and, and, and maybe even an appeals court having to, to uh, address it. Well, well, Ken, as we get close toward the end of our conversation, and I so appreciate your time and, and chatting with you as I always do, how can people reach out to you? If they've got a case, they feel like that they need, to, they need the mediation or maybe even need your representation, how can folks reach you? Well, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, if you just Google Ken Simon or Ken Simon Law, you will not get the Alabama football player who played for Bear Bryant, although I do tell people from time to time. Oh, <laughs> all the time. Uh, but I'm afraid they'll get me. Well, that's uh, But that's I'm good easy to find. <laughs> just call me and uh, I'll be more than happy to work with you to get your case set up for mediation or otherwise. And I put a, a clickable link in the comment section to Ken Simon's, uh, KenSimonLaw.com, the website. Now on a, a little bit, maybe more serious note, Ken, okay. with, with lawyers as parents with three now grown children, who mediates any of those types of discussions that from time to time with your just three outstanding children, but at times everybody has their moments. How do those get mediated in the house dynamics? Oh man, you're talking about complicated, uh, <laughs> complex cases uh, and personalities involved. Um, uh, I have learned several things 
uh, as a mediator. Number one, first, do no harm. Uh, two, discretion is often the better part of valor. Uh, and three, just don't get involved. <laughs> just don't get involved. Uh, so if, uh, if our three children are having some dispute among themselves, um, I know to keep my distance because they will eventually work things out uh, in their own way. If any one of them uh, happens to get into an animated conversation with Sabrina, again, uh, well, actually, it's not so simple. I know whose side I have to take. Uh -huh. Well, I want to pause you because one of your three just signed on. So you might oh, want to be careful. But here's the, here's the, Sarah just signed on. Oh, but here's Lordy. what I wanted to say is now with Zach, uh, you're, do you know the term mishbuka? Yes. It means family. Well, you're marrying in, Zach's marrying into another family of lawyers. Oh, so they are, they are every, I don't know if Mr. Ragsdale's on here yet, but maybe he'll get to see this. But I, I think I might defer to Mr. Ragsdale at this point. You can kind of let him take over some of those disputes and you just step aside <laughs> from time to time. Well, just as Sabrina is she who must be obeyed, Barry is a similar figure. <laughs> So if, if, if Barry has entered an appearance in a dispute, <laughs> well, I'm not going to win. So I'm just well, that's, going to pretend I didn't hear it. Other than Barry being a lifelong St. Louis Cardinals fan, I, I don't have any other problems with him mediating anything. But Ken, I, I want to thank you again for spending some time with us today and, and sharing your story and your positions about how mediation can be successful and why it's so, so important. So thank you. Well, thank you for the invite, Bernard. I look forward to having a chance to, to visit with you on your front porch or mine and having that glass of wine. Hopefully very soon. Indeed. And guys, as always, 10 o'clock on, on, on Saturdays, on Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Central, we try to bring you conversations, uh, interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And Ken fits that bill in four different ways. So thank you for spending some time with us today. And as always, be patient during this time. We're not going to be in this pandemic forever. Just be smart. Do the right thing. And we'll be out of this, hopefully, before football season starts in a few months. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You guys have a great rest of your week. Take care. Yeah.